Good evening, everybody. How are you guys doing this evening? Hopefully everybody can hear me loud and clear and I'm coming through. Um, got a couple things as usual uh, that I want to cover. And then I will start getting to the uh, chat and answer some of your guys' questions in there. So um, hopefully you guys had a good Mother's Day and got to spend it with someone that you care about. Uh, myself, I was on call this last weekend. Well, I had another tech who's um, kind of like a beginner tech who was on call. And uh, he uh, he handled actually some of the calls by himself. And then I did have to go out because we kind of got bombarded towards the end of the day. So I got uh, um, I went out and helped him with a couple of them. So, yeah, I was on call. But it was a good weekend. My wife had to work, too. She's a waitress. So um, she had to work on Mother's Day. So we were able to see her in the morning. And then we all got to meet for dinner at the end of the night. So... We were not like a uh, majority of the crazy people out there. I don't know if any of you guys did it, but we don't go out on those busy days. So we didn't go out to go to any restaurants or anything. We just had some dinner at home and tried to avoid the craziness and the crowds and all that. So um, I see some of the questions already coming through and I will get to those guys. So let's uh, if I if I forget or something like that, don't hesitate to put them back into the chat again. And I will try to get to them, but I want to cover a few things real quick. And then also for those of you guys that are um, in the chat right now, uh, I encourage you guys to stay watching the stream as long as possible because I will be doing a giveaway somewhere through the stream for, um, I finally got what I had ordered. I'm going to be giving away a copy of the commercial refrigeration by Dick Wars. So uh, it's the newest version that they have. So I'm not going to do it right now, but we'll let a few people come into here. But we're going to, I didn't announce this to anybody because I wanted it to be a giveaway for the people that come to the stream regularly. So that's why I didn't want to make it like a big ordeal or anything like that. I just want to make it for you guys that are in there. And uh, to be eligible, essentially, you just need to, when it comes time, it's not time to do it right now. But um, when it comes time, you just got to be active in the chat. And I'll tell you guys when, and then that way the night bot can pick a random winner and I'll get it shipped out to you guys. Now, the only specification that I have is that if you guys are not in the United States, then we'll have to work something out with the shipping because I can't afford to pay, you know, for a ton of shipping costs to ship all over the world or anything like that. But we'll try to figure something out. So if I do when it comes time and I'll, I'll say all this stuff again once that time comes. So but again, it's not right now. It'll be a little bit later. So. Gordon Farmer. Thank you very much, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Justin, I, um, I didn't announce it to anybody. I just wanted to, uh, make it a surprise. So again, you know, I want to try to do something for you guys that come in here all the time. Cause I really appreciate you guys doing that. So, and you know, I could have made it bigger and stuff, but yeah, let's not do that right now. So I just want to go over a couple topics here in a few minutes, uh, and then, uh, I'll get to some of your guys' questions and stuff. So, um, I had a couple emails. Um, let me see which one I want to start with. So, you know, uh, and I'm going to talk about this. So uh, I released right after the live stream last week, I released a video that I told you guys I was going to release on that little hot logic mini, that little thing that you cook inside, you know, you can heat up your lunch essentially while you're on the go. Um, I had a bunch of questions about that and I answered most of them in the emails and different things, but I'll address some of them right now. So, um, excuse me, the, it is a 115 volt um, uh, plug on there, okay? They also make a 12 volt plug. So you can either buy the 115 volt unit and buy a power inverter that actually, you can buy a set that comes with a power inverter, you can plug it into your cigarette lighter. Or for those of you that aren't in the US that are interested in it, you can buy just a straight up 12, or 12 volt version, okay? So it literally just plugs into your cigarette, cigarette lighter and there's no inverter needed. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, in that video that I released is a link to an Amazon, whatever link or whatever, and you can buy it from there, but it's called the hot logic Mini. And again, I want to give props to, it was a chiller chick on Instagram that turned me onto that because I just happened to see her on her Instagram talk about heating up her lunch inside of a you know mechanical room or something like that. And I've used it, um, three times now, I think. Yeah. Three times. And it works really cool. So I used it once at home and then two times out in the field. Uh, the one thing I will say, and I mean, it's just something you got to deal with is depending on what you're cooking, like one day I cooked the same thing that I cooked in the video um, out on the road with some chicken and some spinach and stuff. And uh, I'd advise you guys to crack your windows because my van smelled like spinach. 
So, you know, it's just one of those things, but at least I had a hot lunch. I really wasn't intending on cooking it in the van per se. I think it'd be better served, you know, taking it up onto the roof or something like that with you. And, um, what I did was I just prepared my lunch and, uh, threw it in my ice chest, the whole dish and everything. And then when it was time, I just took the dish out and put it into the hot logic mini and plugged it in for when I cooked it on the road, it took two and a half hours is what I cooked it for. And it cooked the chicken perfect. And it was from raw or raw chicken. So it worked out really nice. Um, I've got some different ideas that I'm going to try this week. Uh, you know, we bought some stuff from the store and we're going to try a few different things and see how that goes. So I just thought it was a pretty cool idea. And that kind of leads into another topic is that, you know, us as service techs out on the road, we tend to not eat well, right? I mean, we eat food that tastes good, but it's not necessarily good for us. You know, hamburgers and fast food and fried foods. We got to stop that. I got to stop that. I'm, 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 you know, in horrible shape compared to 15 years ago. Um, you know, just typical, just like a normal person. Uh, I'm, you know, 35 years old. So, you know, it happens, but it's just one of those things. I want to try to start eating healthier and start um, also saving money because on average, at least here in Southern California with the food costs and everything that's so high, like, you know, I'm spending 15 to $20 a day on lunch. So that gets up there. So it starts to get a little out of hand when you look at the end of the month and you're like, I spent what on lunch, you know? So if I can start preparing my stuff, it's a way for us to save money, but then also eat healthier. You know, we can eat leftovers, we can do whatever. So I just thought that was a cool thing. So I know that was kind of a different video and hopefully you guys weren't freaked out by that. I wasn't, I'm not going to be like doing cooking videos or anything like that on a regular. That was just kind of a cool little thing I thought I'd put on there. So, all right. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'm really not paying too much attention to the chat right now, guys, but I'll get to it here in just a minute. So looking at my list right here. Um, Oh, here's another good one too. I know that um, most of you guys probably understand this, but you would be surprised how many people I get emailing me asking me if they can come work with me and they're willing to pay me. Guys, I can't. I can't do that. It sounds cool, but you know, I can't. I can't train people for money. Um, there's so many different reasons why I can't do that, but insurance is the number one. So uh, my insurance wouldn't cover anybody riding with me that doesn't work for me. So, uh, you know, commercial insurance is totally different and my customers job sites and everything. So it's not really something that's feasible. I uh, just kind of got to nip that one in the butt because the questions keep coming out and it's just not something I can do. So, um, all right, uh, let's, let's address some of the, um, another question I've been getting a lot to is a lot of people from, uh, the United Kingdom and parts of Europe. Uh, even some parts of Australia have been commenting on the videos and they've been very curious about the refrigerants that we're using. And I know that a lot of those places, you know, they've banned a lot of the refrigerants a long time ago. Uh, we are in the process of phasing out production of a lot of refrigerants and uh, importing of a lot of refrigerants. Okay. But we still are allowed to use a lot of refrigerants that are banned in those countries. And uh, it's, it's slowly, you know, we're changing. The United States is a little slow to change things, but we're getting there and a lot of the phase out is starting to happen. So, um, you know, it's just kind of funny because I get so many comments that and uh, especially from Europe and United Kingdom, people saying, how can we use uh, mechanical temperature controllers and uh, mechanical time clocks? You know, apparently in those countries, they pretty much everything is digital. And, and, you know, we're going digital with a lot of stuff, but there's just still a lot of older equipment that doesn't have digital. So we're, you know, we're working our way there, but we are very stubborn. Um, I am very stubborn in general. You know, I don't like change. I slowly adapt to change and it just doesn't come abruptly. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get to the chat. So if you guys have already put questions in there, let's throw them in there again and I'll try to address them. Um, and I'll see if I can get to them. And I'll try to uh, answer some more of my other stuff that I have later on. So I just want to don't get, don't want to get too far behind. So, all right. Uh, oh, another really good thing too, or quick thing I want to point out is I've already addressed it many times, but let's try to keep restaurant names out of the chat guys. For the most part, when you guys put in the chat and I know you don't mean anything by it, but for the most part, when you put in there, Hey, that looks like this particular restaurant, I delete those. So I don't know if you guys ever go back because not that you're guessing the restaurants that I'm working at, but I try not to draw any unwanted attention. And I, I try not to ever reveal where I'm working just to protect the customer. Um, you know, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. So if you guys can just please leave it, even if you know, 
you know, I'm working at a particular chain or something like that. Try to keep it out of the, the YouTube comments or, or, you know, different things like that. Okay. If you really want to address something like, you know, where I'm working and you have a question, send me an email. I can answer things in emails, but I'd rather not answer them on public forums when it talks, you know, talking about my customers. So, all right. Uh, big J's barbecue. You said compressor runs extremely hot on equalized pressure, checking windings and they're normal. doesn't seem to be a blockage in the line set and TXV doesn't seem to be the issue either. Well, if you said compressor runs extremely hot and your pressures are equalized, if you have the proper voltage going to your compressor, it sounds like you have a bad compressor. Um, you know, without being there, it's a little difficult, but you know, if, if your compressor's hot, it's got equalized pressure and you have voltage going to it, that compressor's not pumping. Um, if you say that you check the windings, uh, then it's definitely bad because if the windings have continuity across them and you have a hot compressor, you have voltage and it's not pumping and the pressures are equalized, you definitely have a bad compressor. So it's time to replace it. Uh, but don't just replace the compressor after you replace it. You got to diagnose as to why it went bad. But you, unfortunately, you're going to have to change the compressor first. Then you'll be able to diagnose once you get the new one and they're running what caused the old one to go bad. So, yeah. And like Justin said, if you guys can put your questions in caps lock, it really, really helps us to get to them because he's trying to help me. And, you know, we miss miss a lot of them if if you're not putting them in caps lock. So, Okay. Yeah, uh, this person, uh, my good friends, they are nice. You said the walk-in was still using R12. Yeah, so not the one that I was working on, but the walk-in cooler next to the walk-in freezer that I was working on still had R12. In fact, I had a technician on a walk-in freezer today that was still um, R408A, which is a replacement gas for R502. So we still have some older systems out there. So they do exist. How is the redfish, Nathaniel Crumb? So Nathaniel, I actually used the redfish meter for the first time yesterday. Um, I was doing some testing and I have to say, so I'm, I'm making a video about it, but I have to say without, first off, it's it's got so many features that there's absolutely no way you can use it without reading the instructions, okay? So um, I watched a video really quick that Jim Bergman had put up and I was trying to do a, capac a capacitor under load test, and uh, it was a little bit of a struggle the first time. Once I kind of figured it out, you know, I got it, I, I got it figured out, but I do have to say there was a few frustrations that I had. Um, not saying it's a bad meter, it just, it wasn't like just turn it on and go, okay? And I have to say that um, I don't use all the different features, but for instance, I'll give the example, my field piece SC660. Um, one of the, my favorite features about that meter is the phase rotation test. And the first time that I did it, I essentially turned the meter to phase rotation. I didn't read the instructions and I was able to figure out how to do the phase rotation test. Um, that's what I'm looking for. You know, obviously, obviously when you get into the really technical stuff, like the, um, the capacitor test under load using their app. Yeah, I, I understand you're going to have to watch a video or read the instructions, but I just got to say it was a little frustrating trying to figure it out at first, but yesterday was the first time I've used it. So I got a bunch of new tools that um, I'll be making videos about. I just um, actually, I'll tell you guys, if, if you guys don't already know, there's a great, great um, deal going on. I don't know for how long it's going on, but um, I'd been thinking about getting the um, true blue, uh, vacuum setup, you know, that big, fancy, really expensive vacuum setup that, uh, AccuTools put out and I've been researching it and it was just kind of hard to make the jump. But the other thing I'd been thinking about getting was that, and this is more of a novelty was that battery operated vacuum pump by Navac. Okay. So, um, true tech tools actually has a deal. It's actually through Navac, I believe, but if you buy the tiny Navac pump, and you buy the True Blue Professional Kit, which is the really expensive one, you get, I believe it's $150 off of the, of the deal, of the package, right, for, for both of those. And don't get me wrong, that True Blue Kit was like 600 bucks or something without the micron gauge, so um, it was quite expensive. Uh, but by buying them together, I saved 150 bucks, and then on top of that, I used Shop Talk's discount code, and I got like another $89 off. So I saved over $200 by buying them together through true tech tools. I thought that was a pretty cool deal. So I use the, the discount code, um, shop talk and that's Zach Ciotto's discount code. And then it was, you just got to look at their website. They have like promotions where you can see the deals. I thought that was a really, really good deal though. Um, Kavon Hill, you said, do I use the DL 429 meter? 
No, I don't. Um, I won one actually from Zach Ciotta, um, a while back and I gave it to one of my technicians and he uses it. Um, the one thing I will say, I don't see him using it, but he goes through batteries a lot with that meter. I don't know. Do any of you guys that use that meter burn through batteries? I don't know if he's doing something wrong, but I mean, I'm telling you, he burns through batteries like every other week. It's nuts. Sorry about that. I hit the mic. Um, yeah, Ulysses says the true blues are definitely worth it. Yeah, they were great. Uh, and, and I, um, I shouldn't say they were great. I just thought the deal was really great. But, um, so, uh, tomorrow will be the first time I get to use the true blues cause I'm doing a walk-in, uh, replacement where I'm changing an evaporator and a condenser. So I'll use them on that. So, um, okay, let's go down here. I've seen a demo of the Navac pump seems pretty good. Yeah. And that's the battery operated one though. So don't get me wrong. I mean, that's just kind of a fun little pump. Um, I have some ideas for it, but I don't plan on using it a lot, but on little reach in coolers, it would probably be beneficial. Um, and then I think just va uh, vacuuming down recovery tanks and different things like that, it'll be easy. So, um, I've also seen, uh, <laughs> dizzy Dallas says the Navac pump works great. Um, I'm not going to say which person, but he is in the chat, but I have seen someone, uh, that came up with a really good idea that you can buy adapters to make the, uh, the batteries work. And I am going to look into that for that battery operated pump. You can put other manufacturers batteries on there and slap them on there. You can say, if you want to say who it was, but. Um, yeah, only t two CFM, like Dizzy said. So, uh, okay. Oh yeah. So then HVAC or Mark HVAC. So then my tech's doing something wrong if he goes through batteries that much, but okay. So Gary black. Okay. So guys, any of the questions that I've missed, throw them in the chat. Um, I'm going to, um, get to some more of my email list right here. Um, let me get to this question right here. And this came from someone named Max. He says, uh, I'm a young guy. He's 27 who went to college for office work. Okay. So he obviously out of high school, went to college to become a, a desk jockey. Okay. Um, and he's grown tired of the business after eight years. He can't handle sitting at a desk. Uh, he can't see it doing him. He can't see himself doing it for another 30 years. He comes from a family trade of workers. And, um, basically he wants to get into the field and he says, watching videos has helped him to get motivated to get started. But unlike college, there really isn't a clear career path to learning the trade. Um, so his question is, where does he start looking to get into HVAC? Does he join a union? Is an apprenticeship viable for HVAC? He just doesn't know where to begin. He's in Iowa. So my answer to that question is, is, you know, I'm not pro union or I'm not against or for union. Okay. Whatever works for you. I have nothing bad to say about union or non-union. Okay. Um, in my area of Southern California, I will say that the union is not strong. So, you know, if you can get a union job, then good for you. But, um, it's just not as, as strong, you, you know, the different sectors do different things. You know, for instance, uh, I'd imagine that if you lived in Chicago, you could be doing restaurant refrigeration and be union. Um, but here in California, that wouldn't fly because they don't want to pay for that. So it really depends on how strong the union is where you're at and if they can keep you busy um, and you can, you know, stay employed. I mean, that's a great thing. So any it just depends on the area that you're in. Um, the best thing that I would say to do would be to find a service company, reach out to them and ask them, how do I get started? you know, and look into it that way. Remember when you're going to work for a service company, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. You don't got to be a punk about it, but you know, ask them questions. Um, you know, what I would suggest you highly do is volunteer to do a ride along with them. Then you can ride with a service tech volunteer to do two ride alongs, ride with two different service techs. If they're game for that, you know, because then you can kind of talk to service techs that work with the company and evaluate how things work reach out to your local supply houses. You can look up HVAC supply on Google and ask them what companies service techs seem to be happy at. Okay. Um, and again, you know, it just depends on the area. I would imagine, you know, I really don't know Iowa. I don't know if the unions are strong there or not. Okay. So, um, I'm not saying either way, you know, just whatever works for you, just reach out to, you know, uh, local companies and local uh, supply houses and ask them who they're happy with, what techs like working for what companies, okay? Um, as far as doing an apprenticeship, I think an apprenticeship is great in this trade. I think it's the best thing we can do. I wish that I could afford to have my service tech that's riding with me right now be an apprentice for three years. That, that would be the best thing because he would get the proper education. Unfortunately, 
with the way things go and what uh, wages are here in Southern California and different things like that, I can't afford to have him riding with me for three years, you know? So, um, you know, a typical apprenticeship is anywhere from six to eight months. It just depends. Uh, that's how we roll at my company. I know there's other companies that will hire them straight out of trade school, throw them in a van and send them out on service calls. I won't do that. Um, it won't benefit me to do that. I, they got to ride with me. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, there's times when I'm going to send him to do a preventative maintenance and different things. But anyways, I'm going off on a tangent there. But this is a great trade to get into. Um, I think that, let's see, he said his name was Justin. He didn't say how old he was. But um, I'm assuming he's probably in his 30s. It, it, you know, I've had so many people ask me, when is it too late to get into the trade? It's not too late. I mean, there's companies that are willing to hire you now. Um, if you're coming into the trade at 55 years old, it may be a little more difficult to be an installer and it may be a little more difficult to be in a high volume service company, but there's definitely a place for you. So it's never too late to come into this trade. And every service company is hurting for service tech. So do it. We really, really need anybody that's willing to come into this trade. Okay, let's get into the chat here and see what I missed. Um, okay, so let's let's not play with electricity. It says learn install before service. That is a great great point. It depends on you know where you are because if you know how to install, it makes service that much easier. And um, if you're a quality installer, then doing service comes easier too. On the flip side too, if you can service, you also can uh, think about what is a pain in the butt to work on and it gives you a better idea on how to install it better. So it can be flipped on either way. I think you just need to be a vigilant person, be mindful of everybody else and be meticulous in the way that you do things. And, you know, whether you start in service or install, I think you're going to do fine. But, um, you know, it's, it's very important to know both. Uh, you know, there's always things that that we should be, uh, you know, there's always things that I want to learn better. I wish that I knew how to uh, do sheet metal better. You know, I have very, very basic sheet metal skills because I don't do it very much as a service company. But that's something that I wish, you know, I could be a tin knocker and, you know, not have to hire out all my sheet metal work. That'd be awesome. OK. Uh, my good friends, they are nice. You said, how's the new van doing and do I like it? Yeah. So um, the new Chevy van that I have is a uh, it, it was tripping me out because it's a six cylinder. It's the Vortec 4.3 liter V6 but they have it like all tuned, so it has more horsepower than the 4.8 liter, which is what I usually get in my vans, the small V8. Chevy stopped selling the small V8 in their new service vans. So as far as the engine goes, uh, it has more than enough power. I will say it has like a nine speed transmission, I think. It's nine? Yeah, I think so, and it shifts a lot, but it it has no lag when I drive it, okay? Um, it doesn't really run too high RPMs. It does really good. As far as the setup and how I put it together, uh, there's a few things I wanna tweak. Um, my bottles that I keep behind my bulkhead, my nitrogen and my CO2, they're kind of bugging me because where I have them on top of my drawer unit, they kind of clunk around a little bit. Even though I have straps in there, if you really, really don't get in there and cinch those straps down, the bottles kind of shake around and they really irritate you. That was actually driving me nuts today. So I want to come up with a ratcheting system to strap those things down. Uh, my drawer unit is working out really good. My toolbox. Uh, the black one, uh, the only thing on the toolbox is, is after about two weeks of driving around, you realize you have to lock the drawers whenever you get in the van because they will open when you're turning a corner. Um, but other than that, everything else is good. I just wish I had more floor, floor space because um, I still end up with stuff all over my floor and I'd rather have a completely open van, you know, in a perfect world. But yeah, it's working out good so far. I still have yet to mount any of my uh, my batteries for my drills and different things. I haven't figured out a place that I want to put those yet. So, All right. What else do we got here? Why nitrogen and CO2? I use CO2 to blow out drains all the time. Um, but, you know, I've, I've really been questioning carrying CO2 anymore. So um, I've been thinking about eliminating it from my van. The problem is maybe I'll carry two nitrogen tanks just because I don't want to burn through nitrogen so much. Um, but, yeah, I've been kind of questioning that one, too. Why nitrogen and CO2? We've just always carried CO2 to blow out condensers and blow out drains. But um, I will say where CO2 is a good thing is in the summertime, if you don't have water and you have an overheated compressor, you can invert your CO2 tank and blow liquid CO2 all over that compressor and it helps to cool it off really fast. So that is one cool thing about the CO2 is, uh, but you also gotta be careful cause you'll, um, you'll freeze your hose and the hose will crack. So, uh, but yeah, that is a cool thing. Sometimes I'll take the hose off and just invert the tank and then just open the valve and just spray directly out and uh, you blow liquid 
CO2 essentially, you know, on the, um, and it helps to cool everything off. But, um, okay. What else? Um, who else? Hey guys, everybody that's in here, Ted, how you doing? Dizzy. I see you there. John HVAC. What's up, bud? Reefer tech Mark. I see a lot of you guys are regulars in here. Okay. So, um, let's see what other questions do we have in the chat guys? Um, Ralph, I see you there, bud too. Ralph guy, guys, uh, Dallas fan is Ralph and, um, he works for Honeywell refrigerants, like you just said right there. So if you guys have any questions, he's always in here and willing to answer questions. And I also have his email address. If you guys can't get your question answered by him, I can get you his email address. You just got to email, email me. Um, Justin posted a question from Joe 65. Why wouldn't that defrost timer work without a jumper wire? Great question. So, um, the video that I posted today, um, I let the, uh, apprentice that's riding with me, um, wired up and I kind of let him make a mistake and it was no big deal. Okay. He forgot to put a jumper in between the number one and the number two terminal on that particular defrost clock. And the way that we have that defrost clock set up, you have to jumper between one and two. And that's a very common thing on the 81, 45, 20 and on the DTAV 40, which is the Graslin defrost clock is that, um, the number four contact, which is your refrigeration circuit is powered by the number two contact. So you have to make sure that you have that jumper running between there or the number four contact will never get power. So what happened in the video was when we turned on the power, we had no refrigeration circuit coming out of that defrost clock. We had power going into the clock, but nothing coming out. And then I, I already knew what was going on, but I let the guy that was working with me kind of stare at it for a minute and then he figured it out is that he forgot to put that jumper in there. And then once he put the jumper, it sends power. So it's just a way of completing the circuit. Uh, and it's just, you know, you can't assume that it's going to be that way every single time you work on one of those, but this particular one, that's just how it's set up. Um, and it's a very common thing on at least the restaurants we run that way. So, okay, let's see what else. Thank you for the video learned. Oh, right on Scott. A. I really appreciate it, man. How to size up a walk-in for a new evap and condensed unit if you know the box to dim it. Okay, Ralph asked that question. So um, what you're going to do is um, you're going to download a piece of software from the manufacturer. You can do a calculation by hand. You're going to do a load calculation on the box. Um, you can download Heatcraft's engineering manual at heatcraftrpd.com. Uh, and it'll give you basically how to do it by hand. Um, that's going to take you a long time. What I'd highly suggest is... Uh, you can you can have a supply house do it for you. You can reach out to a supply house and say you want a refrigeration load calculation. Um, I'm I'm I have a hard time trusting people when I do those kind of load calculations, so I like to do them myself. So what I did was I just asked the supply house, hey, how do you do your load calculations? And they said, hey, I use this program, and so then I just went and downloaded that program. Most of the time, you don't have to pay for them. So uh, there's two of them that I use. If you uh, Russell Refrigeration, which is owned by Carrier now. But their app, their program is called Restbox, I believe. I'm going to look it up as I'm talking right now, and I'll show a screenshot of it. Um, you can use Russell's load calculation software. Um, and there's another one, too. I'm trying to think. Is it Trenton? Trenton might have a load calculation software. But you just got to look up refrigeration load calculation software and download it. And you just essentially input the information. So um, I'm looking up this uh, load calculation right now. So Russell Refrigeration load calculation software and most of the time they're free downloads yep and hold on just a second and i'll bring it up and show you guys the screenshot so that way you guys can see it so let's go to literature and let's go to products um, support and let's see i have it on my computer so i wonder if it's still free yeah there's a software center on their website um, your email address so they can update you when new software is available um, let me go ahead and put this in right now and I'll see if, uh, I can do this with you guys and I'll show you guys a screenshot at gmail.com. Um, what I can do too is, um, I'm going to put contractor and I'm going to download it. Oh yeah. So it was that easy. Okay. So, um, what we'll do is I'll show you guys the website. I'll pull up a screenshot right now. Let's see if I can handle that. Let's see if I can be this the smart way and turn this off. And I'll bring this over here and show this to you guys. I'm ignoring the chat for the moment, guys. Okay. Um, so what I did was I went to, let's transition this over. You guys should still be able to hear me. I went to htpg.com 
forward slash software dash center. And uh, right here, it's just going to ask you for your email address when you do that. Once you put your email address, it'll let you download the software onto the computer. Um, let me go ahead and transition back into the video capture device. And um, once you do that, you can download that. And then let me find the software, and I will show you guys right now. Uh, where did it download onto my computer? It downloaded somewhere onto my computer. I'll have to make a video on it because I don't want to waste the live stream right now just on me running a load calculation on a box. But um, yeah, once you do the load calculation, uh, it basically, you, you got to make sure you put your outdoor air temperature and what size the walls are. You need to measure the inside dimension. You need to know the thickness of the walls. You need to know what the temperature is on the outside of the box and then uh, your outdoor ambient temperature. And then essentially it lets you do a load calc and then you can slice equipment. Now you don't necessarily have to use their equipment. You can just use their load calculation software if you want. Okay. Okay. Justin R. How do you like the wireless field piece pressure and temp devices so far? Hey, Justin, your question was actually going to be the next one, bud. That's funny. I printed out your email too, Justin. That's too funny. Uh, right on. Okay. So, um, so Justin, Justin had asked how I like the field piece wireless setup. And you had mentioned in your email, Justin, that you were kind of sick of the maintenance on service gauges. The one thing I will say is um, there's pretty much just as much maintenance on the smart probes. OK, the only thing that's cool about the smart probes is, is you don't have to replace the smart probes because the hoses go bad. But you do need to change the little rubber O-rings and the Schrader depressors and the smart probes quite often. OK, so remember that. So you're still going to have to change the O-rings. But I totally understand the push for smart probes. I myself am kind of an old school guy still, so I still like to use service gauges for certain things, but sometimes I will use the smart probes too. Um, but I like the smart probes in general. My favorite smart probes right now, best bang for your buck is the field piece job link probes, in my opinion, okay? I understand that some people like the Testo. I can't vouch for the Testo. I've never used the Testo, okay? So I'm not going to talk crap on them. I do know that the Testo's Bluetooth range at this moment is not as good as the field piece, but I have also heard rumors that Testo is updating their probes and going to go to Bluetooth 4.0 or possibly Bluetooth 5.0 if they're smart. Um, I have also heard, which is a very, very good thing for us, I've heard that in Bluetooth 5.0, there is a repeater function built into the Bluetooth, um, whatever you want to call it. So that is a really, really cool thing. The fact that there might be able to have repeaters, right? Because um, as far as the best wireless probes out there, forget about the software, but as far as the range, the best wireless probes are the I-manifold probes, okay? Because they use a Zigbee protocol and the Zigbee protocol essentially is repeatable. So you can have a great, I've had insane reach with the I manifold stuff. I've been on like a four story building and put repeaters in multiple places and been able to get to the bottom story restaurant. It was insane, but I had to put repeaters all over the place and it basically just has like a mesh network. Then what it does is it takes the Zigbee protocol, the radio communicates to their little iConnect device. And then that is Bluetooth to your phone. So you have to carry the device around with you. But the downside is, is on the I manifold stuff, their software, I'm sorry, I don't mean to talk crap, but their software sucks. Okay. Um, it was much better before they changed everything. And again, maybe I'm just being stubborn. I don't like change, but I don't like the new software with the I manifold stuff. It's just changed a lot of things and, and it's a pain in the butt. But as far as the best hardware out there, in my opinion, is the I manifold probes. Um, but the best bang for your buck hardware and software is the field piece probes. The cool thing about the field piece probes is they have their own standalone app. Or if you're doing air conditioning work, it doesn't support refrigeration at the moment. Um, you can use the measure quick app. Okay. But I have heard a rumor that the measure quick app is going to have refrigeration profiles coming soon. I just know that, uh, the guy that created it, Jim Bergman, I've watched a lot of his stuff and he's just working on things, little pieces at a time. But, uh, like the field piece stuff, I currently use it with a Samsung, uh, tab S I believe it's a 10.1 tablet. It's a tablet that's about four years old. Um, it's a great tablet. It does everything that I need it to do. I haven't had any problems. It's a little big and clunky because I have an otter case on it. Um, if I was uh, you, I would suggest not getting the 10 inch tablet because uh, if you get like a, a nine inch or an eight inch tablet, it'd be really easy to keep in your tool bag and it wouldn't be in the way. My tablet tends to be kind of big and cumbersome, you know, all in the way. So hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, Scott A, is it true you cannot charge with the probes? No, you can charge with the probes. What you use is a charging tee. 
Um, gosh, I don't have a picture of it right now, but like I said, I'll do a video where I show it, but on a charging T, essentially it has a Schrader. It's just a service T and it has a Schrader on one side. And what you do is you take a hose. Uh, what I do is I have a, a yellow process hose and I have a ball valve on one side and then I have a low loss fitting on the other side. And then you can uh, put the low loss fitting on the, the, the smart probe and then you put the ball valve on the other side or you can do vice versa. That way you can charge via your ball valve. So no, you can definitely charge with smart probes. It's definitely possible and some argue it's better to do that. So to each their own and whatever you like. Okay. Okay, Familia asks, why is it not necessary to check sub cooling on a walk-in with a receiver? Um, okay, I'm gonna answer this as best as possible. It's, sub cooling does matter, okay? But when you have a receiver, it's not a measurement that's as important, okay? Obviously, you need subcooling coming out of your condenser because the subcooling coming out of your condenser indicates that your refrigerant has changed state to a liquid form. But once it hits the receiver, inside the receiver, you have liquid and vapor in there. And um, essentially, we just need to know that we have liquid coming out of the receiver, okay? I'm sure there's a much more technical answer there, Familia. Um, I'm not the person to give you that one. I would highly, highly suggest you um, reach out to Brian or he can come up with a really technical answer for you. But, you know, I, I just want to reiterate, it does, I mean, we do need subcooling coming out of the condenser. But it, the problem is, is if you're going to measure subcooling on a walk-in cooler that has a receiver, where do you measure it? Do you measure coming out of the receiver? Do you measure coming out of the condenser? That's the problem. A lot of people don't know where to measure it, okay? And, you know, you can't, you know, a lot of times there's not a space, a lot of space coming out of the condenser. Um, so everything can be, you know, it, it can, you, your numbers can be completely skewed. So that's why we always say just really ignore subcooling, clear your sight glass, and pay attention to evaporator superheat, and then compressor superheat will follow. So hopefully that answers that a little bit for you, Familia. Okay. Um, Brandon HVAC asks, do I have my own company or do I work for someone else? So Brandon, I am co-owner of a refrigeration company. I work with my father. Um, he does not work out in the field anymore. I grew up working for him ever since a little kid. This is the only refrigeration and air conditioning company I've ever worked for. I do have our own employees. Um, my position in the company is, is that I'm a service manager, uh, and I basically, I run the outside stuff. He runs the inside stuff. I do go into the office one or two days a week and deal with that. But honestly, if I can stay out of the office, I prefer. I like fixing things and turning wrenches and I hate dealing with paperwork. So I have the best part in my opinion of a business ownership because I get to stay in the field and have someone else run the office. That's how I like to do things. Um, and I lost the chat here because I clicked out on this. There it goes right there, perfect. Okay, um, is calling you back, ready to return as a guest. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll go back on HVAC Shop Talk for sure. Wakanda forever. There you go. I was just watching, uh, I finally watched, and I'm not going to leave any spoilers in here, guys, but Zach's kind of been going back and forth talking. Uh, I finally watched Endgame uh, last weekend. Not this weekend, but the previous weekend. And uh, it was a cool movie. But I have to say, I don't know if for you guys that have watched Endgame, I'm not going to talk about this for a long time, but it started off kind of slow. Honestly, like the first 45 minutes into the movie, I was like, uh, kind of bored. And then it really took off and got awesome. So, all right. Prime time. You had such a headache recently because you had a faulty receiver and it can be hard to detect. Prime time. I have never had to um, diagnose a faulty receiver, but I've had something similar and it was a mistake that I made many, many years ago. So guys, prime time mentioned that he had a faulty receiver. So what can happen, especially in the bigger receivers is the dip tube can break off. Okay. If the dip tube breaks off in your receiver on the inside, then what happens is, is you dump liquid into the receiver, but, but the dip tube that pulls the liquid from the bottom to go out to your metering device can be broken or cracked so it can pull vapor too. So you can have more than enough refrigerant in the system, but you're still feeding vapor to the expansion valve. And that can definitely be a head scratcher. That's a very, very difficult one to find. So essentially, um, you know, there's a lot of ways you can do it, but if you have a system that you're starting from scratch, if you know that you have that receiver 80% filled, 
you know, pumped down and you still have vapor coming out of it, that could be a good indicator that we might have a problem. Okay. But it's kind of difficult to be able to pull all the refrigerant out and, and, you know, know exactly how much refrigerant that receiver can hold. So that can be a difficult one. Now I'll tell you my story. So I had a coaxial water cooled condenser many years ago. This was the first water cooled system I had ever worked on. And what I did was, um, let me check my text messages here because make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks. Um, the, uh, the coaxial condenser was fouled so bad that I couldn't clean it anymore. If you guys don't know, fouled means that it's so calcified inside. It had mud and dirt inside the condenser um, where in the water section that we couldn't clean it anymore. And that's one of the downsides to a coaxial condenser is you can't run brushes to it on a tube and shell condenser. You can pop the end bells off and you can run tubes through it or punch the tubes like they say. So anyways, um, we had a, a system that had a coaxial condenser and I wanted to go ahead and replace it, but I wasn't going to put a coaxial back in. So I bought a tube and shell condenser. We installed it and we, we vacuumed the system down, followed everything like we were supposed to. And then we went to go charge the unit and we could not clear the sight glass for the life of us. And the box would not come down to temp. It was driving us nuts. We kept adding refrigerant and kept adding refrigerant. And I knew something was wrong. You know, when you're at 20 pounds of refrigerant on a system that takes 15, you're like, okay, there is a problem here and it won't pump down. Okay. I knew something was up long story short, because it was a tube and shell condenser and it was, uh, not a factory replacement. It didn't have the mounting brackets on it. Okay. So we had no orientation or we, we had no, no haul. No, we did not know which direction the condenser went. So what had happened was I had turned the condenser 90 degrees, the wrong direction or 45, whatever. I just turned it the wrong direction. So, um, we did not have the refrigerant coming out of the right place. So it was acting like it was undercharged when in fact, all we had to do was rotate the condenser. And that was a nightmare. That, that, that one must have been 10 years ago. That, was, oh, that one was just a disaster for us. But remember, guys, I, you know the, the, the things that I talk about in my videos and these streams is because I've made these crazy mistakes, okay? So um, let's see what else. Okay, yes, and sadly, the receiver took the compressor with it. Damage had been done. Yeah, prime time, definitely, man. That sucks, dude. Uh, yeah, I've never had the opportunity of breaking it off. Oh, thank you. Let's not play with electricity. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys, uh, we have enough people in this stream right now that I'm going to go ahead and do this giveaway real quick. So um, again, this is just for the people that are in the stream. Hang on just a second and let's see if this works out right. Uh, it should pop up in the stream when I click. So remember, here's the deal. Uh, Reefer Tech Mark, all or any other unit for that matter, not much experience for side. Um, Reefer Tech Mark, someone made a really, really good video on potential relays today. And uh, send me an email, Reefer Tech Mark, and I'll explain it to you, okay? Because it's more of a visual thing. I try to remember the guy's name. He put uh, AC Service Tech, actually, put out a really good video today on uh, relays in fractional horsepower compressors. And I thought it was really, really cool where he broke it down and showed it, okay? All right, so here's the deal, guys. I am giving away a copy of Commercial Refrigeration for Air Conditioning Technicians by Dick Worse. This is a not this one. I have a brand new one in a box that I'm going to give away to someone in the chat right now. I'm going to do a random drawing in just a second. All I need you guys to do is start chatting right now, okay? And just listen as I'm talking. Just put something in the chat to make yourself eligible, okay? Um, now, here's the only thing. If you do not live in the United States, the book is still yours, but you got to help me out with the shipping, okay? So we'll figure something out. If I draw your name, and this is only for someone that's in the chat, I need you to send me an email with your information, okay? And I'll get you the book. Um, but again, if you live outside the United States and you win, we'll have to figure an arrangement out for the freight, okay? Because I will pay for the freight anywhere in the United States, but I won't pay for it to the United Kingdom or even Canada sometimes hurts, okay? It just depends on how much it is, okay? But we'll figure it out. So I'm going to let you guys keep chatting for a minute. I'll let it go, and then I'll hit roll here in just a minute. So just anything. All right. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. All right. Um, and I'll get to your guys' questions. Just put something in the chat and I'll send it over to you guys. So hold on. Keep it coming. <laughs> Justin. All right, Justin, pick one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Night bottle do it. So um, it's funny, too, because on my side, guys, uh, the chat is going so fast right now. So, um, OK, guys. Let's go ahead and uh, if you haven't put something in, keep it coming. 
and I'm going to do one here in just a second. All right, here we go. I'm going to pick someone here in five, four, three, two, one, boom. Stop. Okay, so Firefox Dimitri, you are the winner, or Firefox forward slash D-M-I-T-R-Y. You are the winner of the uh, the book. So I need you to send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. No, more comments don't make your odds any better, bud. <laughs> Justin, he's lost. It's funny because every, every, every second I see a little comment from Justin going by right now. <laughs> Firefox Dimitri, I need you to send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. All right, guys. Right on, bud. So you are the winner, bud. All right. I will do more of these guys' giveaways, okay, guys? But I'm not going to announce them because I want to do stuff for you guys that come into these streams. Um, you know, I'll do something on my channel, too, you know, where I do like I did with the spoiling thing. But I also want to help you guys out that just come to the stream. So right on Fire Firefox. I think it's Dimitri. I think that's how you pronounce it. So you're the winner, okay? All right. So um, let's get back to normal questions, guys. If you guys have normal questions, put them in the chat. And uh, let's try to get to those. And I'm going to look at my list right here. Um, let's see what else. Uh, emails. Oh, you know what? Uh, this is just a funny thing. Okay, so you know that I, I put these videos out, right? And I get lots of people that send me emails and different questions. And it kind of made me laugh the other day because I got an email. Actually, I got th three emails from my competitors, okay? People that worked for my competitors, people that are in my area. Dizzy, thank you so very much, man, or Dallas. I'm sorry, but I really appreciate it, but um, for the super chat. But yeah, I had three emails from my competitors saying how they really appreciated my videos. And it just kind of made me laugh, right? Because here I'm teaching people like my little tips and tricks and they could theoretically be bidding against on jobs with me. But it is what it is, guys. I'm still going to share the little bit of knowledge I have no matter what with anybody. Okay, so I'm going to keep these things coming. But I just thought it was kind of funny that I'm getting emails from my competitors. It just kind of made me laugh. Like, And I don't think they know who I am. I don't think they know my service company. But they just happen to email saying thank you. And it's like, and, I, and I'd ask them, hey, what service company do you work for? And it's like, oh, yeah, I know who you are. You know, I, it's just kind of funny. It makes me laugh. But. All right. Really appreciate it, Clint. Thank you very much, man. Um, let's go to, yeah, type your questions in caps and let's see if I'm missing anything. Really appreciate you guys. Um, let's see what else. Matt Sprinkle, you said subcooling during low ambient versus high ambient. Um, some more context to that one. I'm going to be honest with you, dude. Um, I'd be better off if you emailed me on that one, Matt. Matt Sprinkle, uh, HVACRvideos at gmail.com. And I can answer it a little bit better and just give me some more context in it. Um, some of these questions, uh, you know, it's kind of hard for me to answer right off the top of my head. And I don't want to confuse anybody. So um, really appreciate it, Mark HVAC. Thank you so very much, man. Okay, so cool. Firefox, really appreciate it, man. I'll get you that book out, okay? Um, Vibe Resorbers, thoughts. I love them, Reefer. Um, you know, they're, they're very, very important, uh, especially when you're dealing with semi-hermetic compressors. Um, you know, uh, it'll definitely, definitely help. Now, are you talking about vibration eliminators or are you talking about hydropads or hydrosorbs or whatever for the bottom of the compressors? Reefer type mark. Um, okay, so Jesus Santos says, what is those... What are you saying there, bud? I see the smoke detectors. Yeah, that's a smoke detector trainer board behind me. So I've got some videos on it where I show a duct. I think it's called duct detector explained or something like that. But that's a trainer board that I set up for myself. And then I started training my guys on it. Um, so essentially, it's got some blinking lights on it right now. I have it plugged in. But I can simulate duct detector, simulate trouble conditions, and we can troubleshoot it electrically. So it's just a trainer board that I made. So um, has anyone used that? Elatech digital pressure gauge. No D Hinton, but I'm going to be honest with you. I bought an Elatech meter one time. Uh, I think it was a, a mega ohm meter. I think it was an Elatech and I was not a fan of it. It was a pain in the butt. Um, just in music, man, music, man, how much, Oh, I, I don't know what music, 
Music Man. It says, how much does an HVAC company charge an hour? It depends on the area you're in, bud. Um, so, you know, here in Southern California, refrigeration service companies uh, can charge anywhere right around the $100 range. Um, starting, you know, in the 90s and all. Scott A., thank you very much, man. All the way down to, I mean, all the way up to $120 an hour. It just depends, man. And it depends on the region and, and who's working. Is it a union company? Is it non-union? Is it commercial industrial? Is it residential? It there's so many variables inside that, bud. Um, I'd be happy to answer some more of your questions if you want to send me an email, bud. So HVACRvideos at gmail.com. Scott, thank you guys that are doing these super chats. It's so awesome that you guys are doing that. Thank you very much, okay? Um, Alexander's Refrigeration, he says, is the dial a charge still good? Yeah, it is It is still good. It's not a, um, a, a heated one, so it doesn't have... Uh, a plug or anything like that. I know there were some heated ones out there, um, but yeah, it still works. I mean, it's just an old dialer charge that one of my employees brought. His dad got it from a garage sale for me. I never used it, dude. The only tool back there that I used is the um, up on top of the shelf right there is the um, uh, hermetic compressor analyzer. That was my hermetic compressor analyzer that I used to keep in my van. So uh, Jesus Santos, are the smoke detectors wired in series to red? No, sir, they are not. So um, that, I, I actually cover that in my video. I typically, I mean, you can go to red, but here's the thing you need to understand about smoke detectors is smoke detectors, the fire department wants an emergency shutdown. They want immediate shutdowns. Oftentimes, if you wire just to the thermostat wires, you can have a problem. So for instance, if you wire to red, depending on how you tie it in, it might not have an emergency shutdown, meaning that it won't shut down within like five seconds, okay? Most modern uh, package units on the roof have emergency shutdown features. So basically, it completely shuts down the unit. If you were to get into a duct detector and you didn't have an emergency shutdown feature, I would highly suggest that you find the 24 volts coming out of the transformer and kill that. Um, but don't try to kill power going down to the thermostat. That's where a lot of people make mistakes because if you kill power going down to the thermostat, you could still have a delay because your circuit board could still have something going on inside the unit. So you always want to look to see if there's an emergency stop feature within the HVAC unit. Um, and I can, you can follow my video again, I'll try to find a link to it right now and you can, uh, I'll throw it in here, but give me just a minute. Um, Jeff Goley. Yeah. See, so he says the company he works for in New York charges 300 for us to show up and, and 17, 17 an hour or 175 an hour. Um, so, you know, every, every area is going to be different. So 170 got you there, but I see it now. Yeah. So every area is different, you know, and Justin here is in Jersey. Yeah. It's, it's, it all depends on the area. Yeah, so let's not play with electricity. Blower would stay on for 60 to 90 seconds, and that's the exact point when you when you break R. You need to do emergency shutdown because the fire department, understand what a smoke detector is there to do is to shut off the oxygen to the fire, okay? It does not want to fuel that fire with any moving air. So theoretically, especially if you have outdoor air dampers, you could be pulling outdoor air into that fire and fueling it, okay? So um, if you can shut down the fuel source, potentially you could slow down the fire until the fire department gets there. So that's the point of a duct detector. And there's other things too. It has enunciators built in and different things, but I uh, really appreciate you guys if you hit the thumbs up button. It really does help the stream uh, when we have the thumbs up. It helps YouTube to you know do whatever in the analytics and different things. So um, yes, Dave, you said I mentioned latency with regards to using digital manifolds while pumping down or setting pressure switches. Do I prefer analog stubby or do you just estimate based on my experience and time lag? So using digital gauges can be kind of difficult when you're setting pressure controls and like I showed in the video. So what can happen, especially if you just do a pump down, close the receiver and wait for the system to pump down. A lot of times the system will pump down faster than your gauges, maybe like a half a second faster than your gauges can see. So it can make it difficult when you're trying to set a pressure switch for an exact setting, especially, which we don't run into anymore or much anymore, especially if your pressure switch is a temperature controller. That's when it can be really hard, okay? Because remember, a pressure switch, or a low pressure switch, does not, um, does not, uh, it's not accurate, meaning that the numbers on the pressure switch do not mean that, like if you set it to cut in at 30 and cut on, or you know, cut out at 10, cut in at 30, just because those numbers say 10 and 30 on the dial doesn't mean it's accurate. You have to test it with your, your, your gauges, okay? So digital gauges having that half a second latency um, where the digital gauge won't read the right pressure for a half a second, you could theoretically, you know, 
incorrectly set your pressure switch, of which I did in the video. So there's different things you can do. If you can use analogs when you're setting pressure switches, that is the best thing in my opinion, okay? Use a stubby gauge, put it on there, set it, move on. The other thing you can do is um, it's how you open and close the system. So in the video, when I finally set it, what I did was I had the system pumped down and to turn it back on, I barely cracked the king valve on the receiver just enough to let the slightest amount of refrigerant through so that way it slowly rose. And that way my digital gauges could keep up with it. So that's another way to kind of hack still being able to use digital gauges is just pump it down very slowly. And the same thing goes for when you're pumping it down pump it down slowly. Don't close it completely. Just close it down to where the pressure start dropping and keep closing it as you've seen it going lower and lower and just keep closing it, letting just a little less bit of refrigerant through. And then you can kind of, you know, adjust the accuracy a little bit better that way too. So, um, let's see if I'm missing anything else here. All right. Um, hello, grab a Kool-Aid and join us on the spaceship. Are you going to, uh, Oh, Heaven's Gate. That was the Kool-Aid spaceship, right? The Heaven's Gate cult. Where were they at? I can't remember. That was the one where like 15 people all took the Kool-Aid cocktail and killed themselves, right? Crazy. All to go on their spaceship. So, um, All right, guys. What other questions you guys have in here? Is Linux a good brand? Uh, Anthony, it all depends on the... Um, you know, it, I've, I've talked about this before. Is Linux a good brand? It's arguable that Linux is good and bad. Okay, the same thing with Train, Carrier, York, all of them. In my opinion, it all depends on how comfortable your service company is that's working on the equipment. Okay, so if you're comfortable, like I'm super comfortable with Linux package units, super comfortable with Carrier package units, not so comfortable with Train, especially when they get the Reliatel controls. I'm just not comfortable with them. Okay, so one would argue that my first instinct is to say a train package unit with Reliatel control sucks. But it's not that it sucks, it's just that I'm not comfortable with it and I'm not familiar, so therefore it frustrates me, okay? So it really all depends on what you're comfortable with and or your service company's comfortable with working on. Now, do certain manufacturers have certain problems? Sure, okay? Um, is Linux good? Sure, it just depends on what you're working on, okay? I can't vouch for their residential units, but I can vouch for their commercial package units and they're great. But it all depends too, because you can buy a cheap commercial package unit. Linux has like an, a knockoff brand, right? And they still label Linux, but it's just really, really cheap. They don't use the digital circuit board. They don't use Prodigy controls. They have all these, you know, it's just a really cheap unit. So, you know, it, it theoretically could give Linux a bad name. So it all depends on what you're buying. If you're buying the really, really nice high-end package units, I love them to death, okay? So... How do you go about doing PMs on reach and coolers? Well, it all depends on what's going on with the reach and cooler and the environment it's in. Obviously, the, the first thing you wanna do when you're doing a preventative maintenance is you wanna keep the condenser clean. Keeping the condenser clean is very, very important. Um, figuring out some sort of method of keeping that condenser clean is a very important thing too, as in like a filter. But you have to be careful because there's certain filters, and I talk about like a filter media, it usually comes in a hammock roll. You can cut it and put it on there to prevent dust and different things from building up in the condenser. But you gotta be careful because just because you put a filter media on there, there's two things you gotta worry about with a filter media. Sometimes it can be very restrictive, okay? depending on what type of filter media it is. And also some manufacturers, they will actually void a warranty if you put a filter media on there. I think they've kind of backed off that one, but some people will put a filter media on there and then never clean their condenser and the filter media plugs up and still plugs up the condenser, right? So it, you know, that's the first thing you want to do is keep the condenser clean and figure out a way. If you can regularly change a filter media on it, then I put filter medias on my condensers. Then cleaning evaporators, you know, checking motors, listening for normal sounds, things that sound awkward. Um, does the system have a sight glass monitoring the sight glass? Um, you know, just routinely. I wouldn't suggest putting on service gauges on a reach and cooler every single month when you're doing a preventative maintenance because that'll add to refrigerant losses. Um, so just, you know, it just depends on the particular piece of equipment that you're working on. Okay, Jesus Santos, got a good one, Chris. Is a compressor that not going to pump down but still cool a bad compressor okay jesus it depends okay um so a, a test that we used to do is we used to check the suction service valve on semi-hermetic compressors we would front seat the suction service valve and you would have your gauges on there and you'd watch the system pull into a low pressure okay um 
and how low of a pressure and how long it would hold would what would tell you whether or not the reed valve or and or the service the valves inside the compressor internally were working properly okay if you had a leaking valve or reed valve in the head of the compressor it would indicate you know it cause problems so that was what that test would do but with modern um, reciprocating compressors you know like the pot style compressors hermetic hermetically sealed ones a lot of times the manufacturers have gone away from doing pump down tests on them and when i say pump down we're pumping down the suction side okay not necessarily the the, the liquid side that's a whole nother thing we could do the liquid side too you cannot ever do a pump down test a suction pump down test or uh, close a suction service valve on a scroll compressor because scroll compressors don't have valves okay so if it's a refrigeration compressor and you want to do a pump down most of the time they should pump down somewhat okay meaning that you close the suction service valve the low pressure goes all the way down right the more efficient way to test a compressor service valves these days is to use um, software so copeland has an app called copeland mobile and copeland mobile basically allows you to analyze the pressures and the amp draws of the compressor and will tell you if there's a problem in the valves it essentially is looking at compression ratio and different things inside the compressor. So um, I kind of need a little more context, Jesus, but that kind of covers a little bit. But yes, a compressor should go into pump down. OK, um, but another thing to think about, too, is uh, how are you trying to pump it down? Are you trying to pump down the liquid side? OK, compressor should pump down into a vacuum or really low, even if you pump down the liquid side. But um, it might take a little bit longer. Um, there's a bunch of different variables there. So. Um, Jesus, go ahead and send me an email. I can talk to you more about it. So, um, let's see what else we got going on in here, guys. And right on, Andrew, you work for a Linux dealer. So, um, commercial or residential, Andrew Hicks? Um, you know, I mean, it, it all depends you know, some, some, I'm, I'm kind of curious if you're doing Linux commercial or Linux residential. So, okay. Keep thinking PC world would it be bad to have below average prices to gain customers that would be extremely bad keep thinking pc um uh, that's an extremely bad thing there bud in my opinion okay because you're you're hurting yourself and you're hurting your competition let me tell you how this is going to work if you have lower than average prices you are not getting paid for your worth and you are not going to succeed as a business owner so therefore you are putting yourself out of business and you're potentially hurting your competition at the same time. Um, there is some shady companies out there that will keep their prices low just to mess with the competition. That's a horrible thing. It's a poor business practice, okay? Um, I'm not saying everybody has to have the same prices. Don't get me wrong. You need to be competitive, but you need to do what's good for you as a business owner. And don't keep your prices low just to gain customers because you're not going to get the right customers and you're not going to stay in business very long that way. Okay, I am not a business expert. I am not Dave Ramsey, but I know that there's nothing right about having the lowest prices just to keep customers. It's it's not going to work, man. I know this is a hard time with a lot of service companies out there, but you need to your service work needs to shine and uh, you know, you need to work on some marketing stuff in my opinion, but there's much better people that can help you with that stuff. I would highly suggest you look at uh, the Service Business Mastery podcast with Tersh Blissett. He has some great information and he has a great business podcast and uh, he can answer those questions a little bit better, much better than I. But I do know that it, you, you don't want to lower your prices just to get customers. So um, let's see what else I missed in here. So let's see. Where can an outdoor condenser fan blade be found for cheap? Jeff Sutherland. That's a hard one, bud. Um, you know, I, f f judging by your question, I'm assuming that you're a homeowner. And there's nothing wrong with a homeowner wanting to fix their own equipment. Okay, I'm not going to talk crap or anything like that. Um, you know, you might be able to find a supply house out there. Uh, there's a few supply houses that might sell to the public. I'm not a fan of homeowners doing their own work, but it's your own home. You know, and I'm gonna not going to lie to you and say that I don't work on my own car or different things. I'm perfectly capable. But I, what I will say is that you need to be very, very careful. OK, and um, that fan blade that you get to replace your 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 fan blade that's bad. Um, you need to make sure that it's exactly the same. There's a lot of variables with the fan blade, the pitch, the diameter. All of it can affect the way that the motor works. OK. Um, I would, I would really, really urge you to get a contractor to come out and do the work for you. But if you're going to do it on your own, just be very, very careful. Okay. 
Um, let's see what else I'm missing in here. Question. Assuming I have worked on some new carriers, can you shed light on your thoughts regarding the installation or setup of the new W7220 economizer controller question? So the W7220 economizer control is the Jade economizer. Is it not just an R? Um, I'm pretty sure that is. Answer that one real quick. That should be the digital Jade controller. Let me know if that is. It, or I can't remember. Is the 7220 the old electromechanical controller? I can't remember. If it's the electromechanical controller, those things suck. The Jade controller is so much easier. Let me know what it is there. Okay. Um, we should work more refrigeration. Hey, Zeus, right on. Yeah, I mean, refrigeration is good, man. Um, it keeps us busy. Okay, I'm waiting for... Who put that... Um, how would you do about, okay, so how would I go about doing PMs on an RTU unit? Again, it depends, okay? So first off, you need to change the filters on a regular basis and you need to change the belts on a regular basis. Understand that over-tightening a belt is just as bad as having a loose belt, okay? So don't over-tighten your belts. Also understand that belts, um, if they're tightened properly and set up properly, they last a long time unless the pulleys are going bad or the pulleys are out of adjustment, okay? So, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on with that, making sure condenser coils are clean and evaporator coils stay clean. That's very important. A typical um, RTU PM, if I was working on one unit, it all depends on what the customer wants to pay for. Um, in a perfect world, I'd like to do a PM every three months on an RTU unit, and I'd like that PM, typically I would quote it for about maybe three hours with no drive time, meaning that drive time is extra depending on the location. Okay. So I need three hours on site, two to three hours on site to properly go through that unit. Um, I'm probably not going to put service gauges on the unit every single time, but you do need to have a baseline setting for that package unit. So there's going to be every other couple times you need to put service gauges on there. Then you need to uh, do some trending data, meaning that you need to measure some temperatures of refrigerant lines and set a baseline from that point that you can go off of. I'd highly suggest looking into an app called Measure Quick. It uh, teaches you how to do non-invasive testing on air conditioning systems. So essentially, you're going to do a test one time, and then every other time, you're going to you're going to you know do non-invasive. So you're not going to actually put your service gauges on there, and you're just going to check temperatures and compare them to the time that you did put them on there. So, um, I, yeah, I, hopefully that answers some of your questions. Any more questions, send me an email, dude. HVACRvideos at gmail.com. So, let's see, what else? Um, Okay, it's a jade economizer. Dude, the jades are super easy to use, man. Um, there's actually an app or YouTube videos that explain the jade controllers, but um, it's kind of hard for me to throw that out. Number one, I will definitely make a video on a jade controller. I will set up a training board behind me with a jade controller. So I will do that, but at the same time, send me an email, but I can answer it and hopefully send you in the right direction. I, I want to say at one point in time, there was an app that you can download on your phone. In fact, I will look it up right now and see if I can pull it up. It was under Honeywell. Um, it, Honeywell's changed so many times. So let me look up Jade Controller and see if that comes up. No, it's not in there. So let me look up Honeywell. I'm looking in the App Store right now to see where that app was. I swear there was an app that I had. Honeywell Controller, Honeywell Jade. The Jades are the easiest economizer controllers. Once you figure out how they work, they're super, super easy. I know there's something in there, guys. I'm not seeing it right now, but I know that there's a there's an app for the Jade controllers out there. So um, what was the name of that app? The app is called Measure Quick. It's a free app on the App Store. You can download it for iOS and or um, Android. So very, very good. All right. I have been finding that the field installation isn't very easy at all. Such a pesky pain in the ass. Yeah, um, dude, once you figure it out, it's so easy. Like I said, I, it's it's literally answering some questions. The, I will say on the carrier units, um, okay, so the installation, okay, Justin, I think I might know what you're talking about now. So Justin R says that the field installation is not very easy. Such a pesky pain in the ass. So is it a carrier package unit that you purchase from carrier and they sent out an economizer kit that was not pre-installed and you have to install the jumper wires, correct? I've done that before and that is a pain in the ass. Once you figure it out, essentially the the, the pigtail that says DDC, you ignore that one, it's not hooked up anymore. Um, 
but yeah, hooking those up using their instructions is not very intuitive. Well, setting up the controller is super easy. I think that's what you're talking about, Justin. Um, right on. Hey, Isaiah's in here. I'm glad you got a new tool, bud. What tool was it? Okay. Uh, Chris Cooley asked, do the swamp coolers run on thermostats or do they ever shut off in SoCal? It depends on the customer. So um, I have a refrigeration rack that has a swamp cooler cooling the whole rack and that thing is set up on a temperature controller. Anytime it gets below 80 degrees or above 80 degrees, it turns the water pump on, but the air is always blowing. Um, for the most part on a swamp cooler, if you have a temperature controller, the only thing that's going to be controlled by the temperature controller is usually the water pump and the the, the fan is going to be controlled via a switch downstairs or something all the time so um right on justin r right on justin r appreciate it bud okay so um any more questions guys let's throw them into the chat uh let's try to get these answered up for you guys right on isaiah the s man 480 is a really really nice manifold i have it myself and it's a great great tool to have so there, Honeywell just rebranded for Carrier. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody else? Let's throw some more questions in here, and I'll try to get to them. How do you troubleshoot a VFD, Ralph asks me. So first off, you need to have a, a good meter, okay? And you also need to lean on the manufacturer. I say that because you need to be careful. Um, something to understand is, is, and I've been told this, and I learned this the hard way, is, is that... Uh, if you have a VFD drive, you need to trust the amperage reading that the VFD drive gives you versus what you can measure with a meter. Um, your meter isn't accurate enough to read the amperage and the VFD drive itself uh, does a better job of, of detecting the amperage of the system. So if you're setting an overload or something like that, or if you're having an overload condition on a motor, um, you want to run through the 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 parameters inside the VFD and usually there's a way to monitor what the amperage is of the actual motor and you need to use the amperage in the VFD first okay um, I only work on smaller VFDs I don't work on the big giant giant ones so I'm probably not the best person I don't know what you're working on my VFDs are just like on blower motors and exhaust fans so nothing bigger than like a five horsepower VFD just tiny stuff um, so hopefully that answers some of your questions there Right on, Isaiah. Congratulations. Isaiah's turning 19 next week. Happy happy early birthday, Isaiah. So, um, is Fluke the best multimeter? Um, yeah, it all depends on what you're buying, bud. I mean, you know, it, Fluke makes a cheaper meter. Fluke makes a really, really expensive meter. So, it depends on what your usage is for. Um, I have a Fluke 902. It's a great HVAC meter, um, but I prefer to use my field piece. Um, you know, as long as your meter's true RMS, that's a very, very good thing. Um, but it really depends on what you're working on. If you're working on heavy industrial, then you may want to invest in a more expensive meter. Um, if you're buying just for the name, I don't know about buying just because it's a fluke because, you know, it you don't want to do that. But I mean, if, if you're buying because you read really good reviews and it does a measurement that another meter won't do or something like that. Yeah. But you also got to be careful because you can overbuy on a fluke meter, meaning that as an HVAC guy, we can go buy an $800 meter, but we don't necessarily need that for what we're doing. Okay. So it all depends on what you're working on. Uh, do I like those pan tablets? No, I don't. But, um, you guys, we don't have humidity here in Southern California, uh, on an average, you know, our absolute highest humidity in the monsoonal season is 50%. Therefore, we don't have a crap ton of uh, condensation coming out of our drains. So we don't have drain pans for the most part. I mean, don't get me wrong. You still have customers that don't do preventative maintenance. But like in the Midwest or the high humidity states, Texas, different things like that, you know, they have a lot of humidity. So they get that algae and that slime that builds up in the drain. So they have to use those pan tabs. For me, the pan tabs just plug up the drain because we have filter changing companies that'll sometimes come through some of my restaurant chains. And I swear there's more pan tabs in the drain pan than there is water. They're just throw them in there and they never disintegrate because we don't run into the we don't have the condensation as much as everybody else. So I'm not a fan of the pan tabs just because they're just a nuisance for me. But I could imagine I don't want to talk for someone that lives in the Midwest states or the high humidity states because maybe they need them more there. So uh, do I have a video on proper line set installation? Um, not necessarily a video on that. Uh, I would highly suggest you lean on 
um, the manufacturer, such as like heat craft, uh, refrigeration equipment, or the manufacturer of your air conditioning equipment, because they're going to have installation instructions for the line set. Now, as far as proper line sizing and different things like that, you can pull up the old Copeland manuals. I've showed those many times. Um, they tell you how to size line sets and different things. And they also teach you proper piping practices too. Um, I've showed those videos before. Hang on just a sec. I'll pop, or I mean, I've showed those books before. I'll pop behind me right now and grab one. So, um, this is the old Copeland manual right here. And inside of it is all these different refrigeration training manuals. These are very, very old manuals, but they're very high quality and they have a lot of great information in them. Um, I got these when I was in school. As you can see, I have little tabs inside there. And uh, this one's on system design. So this one right here will, will help you to design and or size refrigeration lines. It'll help you to size risers, liquid drains, um, suction P traps, multiple coils, all kinds of different things. So. Um, this is a uh, Emerson Climate Controls Heatcraft Refrigeration Manual. Very, very good book, uh, set of books that you can buy. You can get them off Amazon, different things, different places like that. So um, I will look up some different things. You guys, what I'm trying to do too is um, in the bottom of all my videos, I'm trying to, to put more links in there. So when you guys have questions, I try to throw links down in the bottom of the videos now. So if I'm using an interesting tool, like for instance, the video that I was uh, put up today, I put a link uh, from Amazon for that sprayer that I used. Okay. Actually, it wasn't from Amazon. It was from Lowe's. So, um, you know, uh, click down, just pay attention to the show notes. There'll be links inside those from now on. I'm trying to, to, to put information about the tools and different things that I'm using. So. Um, any more questions, guys? Uh, let's see. Is HVAC a good trade? You're only 18. You don't know anything about it, but you heard it's a good trade to get into, but do you need to be super experienced to get into it? Darth Reven. No, you do not need to be super experienced. You need to be a hard worker. You need to be focused and you need to be patient. And HVAC can be a very rewarding career. Um, you know, depending on the region that you're in, it can be very lucrative, meaning you can make very, very good money. Depending on the the, the, the trades that you get in, um, you can make well over $100,000 depending on the areas that you live in. Um, here in Southern California, a very, very, very experienced HVAC technician can make a pretty good living, okay? Um, at least $100,000, if not more. Um, but it all depends. I mean, you know, if you're working in restaurants, you know, you're probably going to be in Southern California. OK, different regions are different. Um, you know, you're probably going to be in the 80s, $80,000 range uh, if you're a super experienced technician. I mean, you can't be an apprentice or a helper. That's going to take you some time. Um, but starting here in Southern California in the commercial sector, uh, starting out the, you know, fresh out of trade school, the typical wages are anywhere from. 16 to 18 dollars an hour and then on up depending on experience and that doesn't mean you're going to make 16 to 18 dollars an hour for 10 years i mean you might just start out with that and as things go good you start working your way up a seasoned uh, mechanic here in southern california can make uh 35 to 45 dollars an hour restaurant refrigeration okay i'm not talking commercial industrial you get into that kind of stuff and you can go you get into ammonia work and different things you can it just keeps going and going you get into hospital work you get into scientific work it's just crazy work and go okay HVAC is a great, great trade. We need technicians. If you're interested in it, go check it out. Look at a local community college. Look at their program. Um, I'm all for community college educations. I'm not knocking a trade school, but I'm for community colleges because you can usually go at nighttime and you don't have to invest all the money at one time. Um, I don't want you to go and invest forty, fifty thousand dollars in an education because you're going to invest that forty to fifty thousand dollars in a uh, whatever trade school. I'm, again, I'm not trying to single out a trade school. I'm just giving the reasons why I like community colleges, because you can have a very small investment, take one class a semester while you're working an apprenticeship or apprentice job, or you get a helper position with a local HVAC company and you can go to school at nighttime and you can pay a couple bucks and not have to pay a huge lump sum or, you know, have a giant student loan when you're all done. Okay. So just be cautious about getting into the really, really expensive trade schools. And there's no trade school out there that's going to have you making $35 an hour when you finish school. It's not going to happen. Okay. Understand that even if you do go to trade school, if you choose to go that route, you are not going to hit the ground running. And if a company tries to throw you into a van, the moment you get out of trade school, there's something wrong there. And when I say throw you in a van, 
You might be in a helper position where you're riding around meeting people, but if they send you out on normal service calls the day you leave trade school, that's a problem because they're not doing you any good. Okay. Trade school does not teach you how to be a service technician. Trade school gives you an idea what the basics are, and then you have to go out into the field and you have to learn more. It's going to be a learning process for a long time, but it's a great, great trade. So I encourage you to get involved in this trade if you're interested. All right. Let's see what else I'm missing, guys. If I missed any more questions, do I ever work on any VRF units? Thought on the systems. No, Reefer Tech Mark. I do not work on VRF systems. There's a few people. I know Alexander's in here. He does work on VRF stuff, but I don't. So, um, Fly Eagles Fly. You said a book there is $60 per hour. A B book is... For, I don't know what you mean by that one. I'm stepping into a conversation. So, um, how much was that 12 volt rotary tool that you used to sand that pipe in the other video? DJ Subair. Um, I put a link in the video, bud, uh, where it had the price. Um, if you click on that link, it'll tell you exactly. It was an Amazon link. Um, I want to say it was 89 bucks or something. It was not that much money. So um, while I'm talking right now, I will try to pull up that video and tell you exactly how much it was. So if I click on this right here, um, like I said, in the last two videos, I've been putting links in there. So, um, this way it'll help you guys. Uh, let's see. This is the link for it with the battery. Let's see if I can pull this up. Come on. Computer's not being very nice to me right now. There we go. Control C. Here's the link for the rotary tool with the, um, with the battery. And that was an Amazon link. So, um, Milwaukee power sander. No, I, I don't know about Milwaukee power sander. This was a little rotary tool that I used. So, uh, why don't you cool it a bit? People will like the video if they want. He's who sent us. Why do you cool it a bit? Oh, he's just trying to help out Trevor, man, man. He, he's just trying to help out. No, no worries. So, um, it's all good though. Jesus. I mean, if people don't want to hit the thumbs up, it's all good, but so no worries, no need to get upset. So Everybody's just trying to help me out. It just helps when people hit the thumbs up button, but it's not that big of a deal. So, um, all right. Any more questions, guys? Uh, let's see. What is a good hourly rate to charge to service a walk-in freezer? Geo, uh, you, hourly rates are based off of what your expenses are as a company. So you need to find out what your overhead costs are, what your fuel costs, and what your, your expertise is worth, and then you set the hourly rates. You also have to consider what your competitors are charging in the area and be cautious, you know, but you don't wanna just go in there and guess what an hourly rate is, okay? At the same time, it's not fair for you to charge an hourly rate if you don't understand how to work on that equipment too. So uh, really appreciate that, Ralph. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Let's see what else I'm missing here, guys. Um, anybody else? Any other questions, guys? I'm probably going to end this if you guys don't have any more questions. So I want to get to everything you guys got. Let me see if there's anything else on my sheet. Oh, okay. This is a great thing. I'm going to go ahead and answer this real quick. So um, there's a time and place for following every single refrigeration practice out there. Okay. And what I mean by that, uh, there is days that I will use my 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 field piece S Man 480 to pull a vacuum. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, okay? I prefer to not pull a vacuum through my service gauges, okay? You guys that just put uh, the questions in there, I'll get to them in a minute. Um, uh, but there's a time and place that I I will follow all those rules, okay? You have to understand, you have to evaluate things as a service company. Um, and as a service technician, for instance, uh, in one of my, my recent videos where I had a, a, a leak on that walk-in condensing unit or walk-in evaporator, it was raining outside. So I didn't change the dryer. I went back the next day and changed the dryer, but I didn't change it that day. Okay. There's, you have to analyze what's going on and there's a time and place to follow all the practices and there's a time and place not to understanding how systems works is very important. Pulling, pulling a proper vacuum is always important, right? But if you understand, so let's say you pump down the system. You're not going to achieve a perfect vacuum with a pumped down system. When you have a receiver full of refrigerant that's being held back by a king valve, and then the other side of that um, high side is the reed valve and the compressor. The king valve and the reed valve are not 100% leak proof. Okay, so trying to pull a vacuum to get that perfect 200 micron gap vacuum with a perfect decay rate is not always gonna work. You're gonna end up pulling refrigerant out of the system before you get your vacuum down to where it's supposed to be. So you have to know how to analyze things and when to apply certain rules and when not to apply them. 
I am not perfect. I tell you guys that all the time. I make mistakes all the time. And I'm willing to admit, if you guys see mistakes in my videos, I encourage you guys to point them out. Send me a message, right? Put something in the comment. Hey, I don't think you did that right. You don't got to be a punk about it. But, you know, everybody makes mistakes, but you also understand that everybody can't always follow every single practice out there and be the super tech of the world every single day, okay? You got to do what works for you while obviously trying to be the best technician possible, okay? Uh, let's try to get into a couple of these questions. Someone asked if I do these live streams regularly. How often do I do live streams? I do live streams once a week, typically. Now, I want to address this too, but typically I do my live streams Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific time okay or west coast time um but yes consistently and then i put my videos up i put two videos up a week mondays and fridays now understand something guys we're going to try our best to keep these live streams going at 5 p.m pacific every single week uh as summertime you know we get into the data summer there might be a stream we miss or something like that but it's going to happen but right now as things go we're going to continue to do these live streams every monday at 5 p.m pacific time so um, let's see. What's the next question that I have here? Any tips on fixing a copper to aluminum connection? Copper to aluminum connection. Um, solder Weld makes some good products for uh, basically soldering copper to aluminum. I have not used them myself, but I've seen a lot of videos uh, that Brian Orr has done on HVAC school. I would encourage you to look up Solder Weld and uh, they have some, some stuff that might really help you out. Okay. Good night to uh, let's not play with electricity right on but ever work on cascade systems Justin Hensley I've worked on them once or twice but not enough to really really talk about them um, I can you know give you a general idea if you guys don't know what a cascade system is but essentially um, you have a two refrigeration systems within one one refrigeration evaporator is the condenser for the other uh, system so you have a condenser it, it it's it's confusing um, I'm not going to confuse you guys too much more, but it's two refrigeration systems where one condenser is the evaporator for the other one. And it's just helping to maintain really, really ultra low temperatures, tempers, typically, I should say. J Rex, you said, um, let's see, Justin put this in here. Hold on, dude. What did I miss? I missed a question. Where did it go? The question disappeared. Let me find it. Where's Justin's thing? Okay, J Rex. Every Monday, same time Chris is live. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying, J Rex. All right. Um, Thanks. I really appreciate you guys that are coming into here. So I'm going to try to get to the last of these questions. So uh, you should never pull a vacuum through those little hoses. Always use bigger hoses. Reason is the vacuum pump is not full. That is a, a great, great point. So fly eagles fly bleed green brings up a great point is, is that I think uh, Jim Bergman had mentioned it on one of his videos, but typically I think they talk about a, 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 f a word called conductance and speed and whatever, but essentially um, using quarter inch hoses, I think you're limited to like, a CFM or two CFMs or something like that through a quarter inch hose. So it doesn't matter how big of a vacuum pump you use. If you're limited by your hoses, then you might as well be using a smaller pump. Um, so if you use something like the true blue hoses, where they're a true quarter or three quarter inch inside diameter, you're going to basically um, be able to use a bigger pump and pull the system down faster. So, but yeah, you should always be careful pulling through your hoses. Definitely. So, um, okay. So reefer tech mark, the scroll compressors you see have low, low pressures no way to check them how could you tell if the compressor internal protection circuits are not open that's an interesting one mark uh send me an email bud hvacr videos at gmail.com i'd like to have to talk about that uh fluke 196 do i have a favorite micron gauge yeah i prefer the blue vac professional um, I also have a blue vac micro that I've given to a couple of my technicians too, and they seem to like them very much. If you buy any of the new blue vac stuff, blue vac stuff, um, it's Bluetooth too, the newer ones. So, uh, William Anstead, do I have any refrigeration jokes? No, I don't have any refrigeration jokes. Uh, Brian Orr tells jokes at the end of his, uh, podcast. So he's a good person to hear jokes from. Um, okay. It takes, uh, let's see. Um, guys, I think. Let's see, how much is that field piece vacuum pump you use and how efficient is it? Brad Shearer. Um, Brad, full disclosure, field piece gave me that vacuum pump for free. Uh, they gave it to me in trade for letting them come out to a job site and take some pictures of me while I was using their new S-Man manifold. Okay, so full disclosure. I really, really like that vacuum pump. Um, it's a very high quality. The oil change on it is awesome. Uh, it is kind of big. It is kind of clunky. It does take up a lot of space in my van. 
Um, I've heard some things about the rumors about who makes that vacuum pump. And I thought that was a very interesting rumor, but there really is like one major, major manufacturer out there that makes a lot of the vacuum pumps. I'm not going to name them right now, but someone might name them in the chat. Um, I've seen some interesting stuff from their vacuum pumps. Uh, there's another company. Uh, I For years before I had the field piece vacuum pump, I had uh, a JB eliminator pump and it's been nothing but great to me. But the JB pump is also very, very heavy, but it's a lot smaller. So um, I have nothing bad to say about the field piece other than it's a little bit big. But I do have to say the oil change on the field piece is awesome. OK, one of my technicians has the Appian um, whatever vacuum pump Tez 8, I think is what it's called. Um, that's a little bit. It's, it's kind of like the same size as their, their recovery machine, so I have nothing bad to say about the Appion either. Um, my, my top brands of vacuum pumps, though, right now would probably be Navac, um, Field Piece, JB, and uh, the Appions. Those are my four top ones. So I would read a lot of reviews and find what's best for you pricing-wise. But just bigger is not necessarily better when it comes to your vacuum pumps, okay? So depending on what hoses you're using, you might not go, want to go buy an 8 CFM if you don't have three quarter-inch hoses, okay? If you're running quarter-inch hoses, you might as well buy a 2 CFM. So, you know, just pay attention to the, the, the speed of the vacuum. Um, Jim Bergman has a YouTube channel for Measure Quick. I believe he just released a bunch of vacuum stuff on that, that or he released it on the AccuTools website, but just look up Jim Bergman on YouTube and vacuum, whatever, and you'll find all his vacuum videos. But he just released a bunch of different things talking about better vacuum setups and how to do it properly. And I believe True Tech Tools is also going to be releasing or re-releasing a, a book on proper vacuum practices too. So keep your eye out for that. Um, let's see. Any... See what we got in here. Um, you guys throw more questions in here. I'll try to get them. Um, anything else you guys have? I saw something right on. The, you guys that are leaving really appreciate it. Um, let's see what else we got here. Appion, great for big tonnage systems. Yeah, definitely. Appion's great for big tonnage systems. Navac is, um, Dizzy Dallas says Navac. Navac is a great brand. Everybody's talking. They're, they're really kicking ass and taking names right now. They're selling like crazy. So, very, very popular vacuum pump is Navac. Um, all right, gentlemen, uh, I am going to wrap this up. I really, really appreciate all you guys that have come inside here. Um, we are going on hour and a half. So, yeah, it's definitely time to wrap this up. I need to go get some food. Um, so any questions? Sight glasses in the liquid line for a TXV Jesus. It, I mean, if you put it there, it's great. And remember, a sight glass only tells you that it's a full solid column of liquid at that point in the system. So there could be a restriction between that point in the condenser or after that point. So keep that in mind, okay? But sight glasses anywhere in the system are better than not having sight glasses. So um, really, really appreciate you guys coming in here. Uh, if you don't mind, hit the like button. Really appreciate it on the way out. And uh, I'm going to start wrapping this up right now. Um, let's go ahead and hit the bumper music going out and, uh, we will catch you guys on the next one.